So what they all share and ask God because leaven is a representation of sin. So they ask God for seven days to examine my heart. What's in there that does not belong like, belong there? And they, they ask God to cleanse them of spiritual sin for seven days. So there was a physical part of cleaning and there was a sp spiritual part because we know that we are the temple and the house of God. So they cleaned their physical house and they cleaned their spiritual house. So in Luke 22, 14 to 23, Jesus is on a scene and he is honoring the Feast of Unleavened Bread with his disciples, right? So I want you to, to think of the table. The table they had, each, each person had um, the wine, they had their unleavened bread, they had the lamb, they had the yams, they had the rice, they had everything going, right? They had cakes, it smelled good in there. So for their tradition, the, um, somebody was to stand up and read some of the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament, and to give a few words. So Jesus was doing that in this, in this um, scripture. He was giving a few words, and what he said was, remember me. So what was he saying when he said that? He was saying, remember me, because this is the time when Jesus gave his life, right? So he was saying, no longer think of the unleavened bread as a symbol of when you, what you ate when you came out of Egypt, right? But I want you to think of my body without sin, right? I want you to think of that freely broken, just like that, so easy, freely broken for you. Remember me in that. As often as you have the Passover feast and you think and you eat this bread, I don't want you to think of that story before. I want you to think of me. I don't want you to think of the lamb anymore that you put the blood on the doorpost because I am the blood of the lamb and I shed my blood for you. I want you to think of me. I want you to remember me. And he said, when you drink these cups, I don't want you to think of the promise that he made to Egypt. I want you to think of the blood covenant that Jesus made with his own personal blood to sanctify us. He said that I will, I will bring you out to deliver us. Because of his blood, we have deliverance. Because he will redeem us. Because of his blood, he is the redeemer. And because of his blood, we can give him praise with the praise cup and know that he will call us his people. And although we do eat for the Passover, it has nothing to do with food. It's about remembering his body that was broken for our sins. It's about remembering his blood that commemorates his promises. It's to examine our heart. That's what it's about. It's about what our posture is. And I don't remember the exact scripture, but it says, don't do this. So many of us are sick because we just drink and we just eat and we come to have to eat food. But God said, where is the posture of your heart? It's about the posture. Are you willing to give this sin to him? Are you willing to, to even if you think that you ain't got no sin, is something in there that needs to be cleaned? Are you willing to lay before his feet? And it's about the sacrifice. It's about the sacrifice. Let us not be people expecting everything but giving nothing. We need to come before him with a sacrifice, our first fruits, the thing that means the most to us because he has sacrificed so much for us and he continues to. And God was so intentional with when the time of the Passover was because it was the same time where he healed, the, he, he delivered the people of Egypt and then he delivered the world with the blood of Jesus. So the why, why did we celebrate Passover? Exodus 12, 26, and 27 says, When your children say to you, what does, this, what does this service mean? You shall say, It is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he has passed over the house of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egypt, Egyptians but spared our house. And the people bowed their heads low and worshiped God. So that's the why. So how long are we supposed to celebrate Passover? Exodus 12 and 17. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because on this very day I brought your host, grouped accordingly to tribe 
out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an ordinance forever. For how long? Forever. Forever, forever. ever. <laughs> so who is to celebrate this, this feast? Exodus 12, 47 and 49. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let him make, let him make, let the males be circumcised and let them come near and keep it. And he shall be a native of the lamb. No, for no uncircumcised person shall eat. One law shall be for the native born and the strangers who dwell among you. So what is that saying? Anybody can celebrate the Passover. And when they say circumcision, we know they're talking about the foreskins of the male, but now we circumcise our heart. We posture ourselves. So if someone wants to posture yourself at the feet of the Lord, don't forbid them. Allow them to come. So the native born, which is those who, sell, who honor the God of Israel, which is us, and those who may not know that they need to honor but want to honor, let them come and examine their heart. Hello? Okay, there we go. Yeah, um, that was really good. You know, when somebody has a passion to teach something like that, the, the anointing just flows. It's harder for people to preach something like that when they don't really believe it. So it was, that's really good. And um, I know that, you know, for us, there's a lot of things that have kind of taken uh, a change, so to speak. But when I just read that, it says in, I just read it. I highlighted it, actually. If you highlighted it. Exodus chapter, she said 12, right? I think I just highlighted it. It's so self-explanatory, like right in our face. How can we not see it? Where it says, verse 14, Exodus 12, verse 14. This is a day to remember. Each year from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. For all time. So are you still living in time? Then that's something that we're supposed to be doing. Amen. And so get ready. April 16th is going to be an amazing time. I really feel like the Lord is going to do something very special. Um, if you've never done a Passover or a Seder or anything like that, then this is going to be a very unique and special time for us to do this um, and be together and see the glory of God um, amongst his people. Amen. All right. So I'm going to continue with um, Acts and we're going to go, I'm going to break this chapter down into two weeks. I have to simply because... What the Lord showed me in the first 16 verses messed me up last night so much that I can't just go 17 on. I need to just go 1 through 16. So today, we're going to be going 1 through 16. And the word for or, or the title of this particular message um, is called The Ordinary. The Ordinary. So make sure you're writing that down, the ordinary. Hopefully we're still on live. If not, then we'll just continue rolling. I ain't, I ain't even worrying about it. Um, but the ordinary, all right? Let's start off by um, decreeing and declaring our uh, decree for our Bible. Amen? Because even though we, are, we just had a Bible lesson, which was amazing, um, let's decree the word of the Lord for us today, amen, that decree, oh, there we go, in my hand is the voice of God, he tells me how much he loves me in it, he tells me I could be more than a conqueror, 
He tells me I sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If I obey what his word says, I will receive blessings. This is not a religious book. Therefore, I must read it in the context of wanting to build a relationship with the author, Jesus Christ. This is not a religious book. It's a love letter from a father to their sons and daughters. This is not a religious book. It is a legal document from the courtroom of heaven in which I can bind and loose. This book has all legalities to break generational curses that are against my family. This book gives me full authority to manifest the kingdom of heaven onto the earth. This book holds my future and my destiny. This book is alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, and I give it permission to go beyond my bone and marrow to penetrate the deepest part of my spirit. I give Holy Spirit full reign to open me to the revelation and truths of this book. I ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Ordinary, the ordinary. Now, I was so excited about what the Lord showed me that I was like, there's no way I can continue with the whole entire chapter this week. I need to break this word down. And what I'm going to give you is fresh revelation, is fresh bread. Like this thing came last night. And I was very excited because I've been reading through um, Acts and really having um, understanding and giving you more of a of a biblical background on every single verse that we've been reading thus far, but today I'm going to preach because there's a word that the Lord wants to release in this house because there's something that I saw that blew my mind. Okay, so let's start verse uh, 1. We're going to read 1 through 7, okay? Uh, it says here, when Apollos was in Corinth, where was Apollos? In Corinth. It says, Paul traveled through the interior region until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers, and he asked them a question. Did you receive, watch this, the Holy Spirit when you believed? And guess what they said to him? No. We haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. Hold on. How in the world did you believe in Jesus but not know that there's a Holy Spirit? Somebody teach him wrong. Somebody is doing something incorrectly. So what Paul does, it says, then what baptism did you experience? And they go on to say the baptism of John. And Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but, John's, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. Now watch this. John's baptism is only for repentance. You'll never get fire from him. So if people just get baptized to repent but never get baptized by Jesus, they walk with a fireless life. Jesus is the only one that baptizes in fire. John doesn't do that. And so John, his baptism is what we call baptism of water. Right? And so everybody makes it imperative that we, what, get baptized in water, but we forget the fact that we have to get baptized in fire. Fire is more important than water. Because the repentance, yes, but fire is what burns away what we repented from. And so if we're not, if we're not baptized in fire then what happens is there is not a relationship with Holy Spirit. Because the only one that baptizes in fire is Holy Spirit. That is his job on the earth, is to baptize us in the fire of Jesus. So we can get baptized in water and say, well, I got baptized. There's a lot of people that are walking around fireless that got baptized in water. 
They got baptized in water. They got sprinkled, whatever, on their forehead by a priest, whatever it was. And they got, right, water. That water don't mean nothing without the fire. Paul, listen, Paul was telling them, John said, yeah, I baptized in, in, in water. But one greater than me is coming who will baptize you in fire. You know, the Bible never talks about Jesus baptizing people in fire. It doesn't show it. But there is something about when the Holy Spirit came, the part that comes with the Holy Spirit is the fire of Jesus. Because there's a baptism there. So the fire of Jesus, which came through the Holy Spirit, began to fall in different ways. But it's interesting that these men here that were disciples of whoever they were disciples of, obviously weren't disciples of Paul because Paul would have baptized them in fire. Correct? And so watch this. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Isn't that interesting? 12 men. That got baptized. Now, what's interesting is, is that we see now that from the beginning of Acts till we are right here in chapter 19, that the Holy Spirit has fallen different ways. And people have been baptized in the Holy Spirit different ways. Acts chapter 2, they appeared upon them as what? Tongues of fire. Okay? And it rested on them. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his family filled by hearing the gospel. And in Acts 19, now you see them having hands laid upon. So there's not one way that the Holy Spirit can fill you. And a lot of people, oh, we just got to lay hands on you. But some people might get filled by the Holy Ghost by listening to the gospel. Some people might be filled by the Holy And here's the thing. Praying. They were praying. Now, I love Acts chapter 2 because Acts chapter 2 we know was a dialect. They wanted to display the glory of God through their tongue. And that tongue was not a tongue like we speak in tongues, but that tongue was an actual language that the rest of the region heard. And they heard the glories and the wonderful things of God. They got baptized in a language. But then we see in Acts chapter 10 where they got baptized in magnifying tongues. So it's a difference. There's the tongue of language, and then there's the magnifying tongue. The tongue of language could be, God tells me, get on a plane, go to China. I'm in China. I don't know how to speak Chinese at all. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit come upon me, and I start speaking in Chinese. That's Acts chapter 2, baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then I can magnify God like we do here, and we say, throw up a magnifying tongue. That is not a tongue of a language, but it's a tongue that magnifies God. So it's a different baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you get levels of the Holy Spirit in your life. What happens is we've been taught that the Holy Spirit come one time and everything comes. There's different levels to Holy Spirit. The more intimate you are, the more deeper you'll get a revelation of the understanding of him. Now the Holy Spirit begins to move all throughout the book of Acts and Paul begins to lay hands. Why did Paul lay hands? Because Paul had hands laid upon him. So Paul understood the laying of hands because when he was sent out by him and Barnabas, what did they do? They laid hands upon them and they sent them out. But when his eyes were blinded, Ananias came into that house and laid hands on him. So Paul had the understanding that Holy Spirit moves through hands. So he laid hands and he did see it. Why? Because it says they got baptized in the Spirit and began to prophesy and speak in other tongues. Now, this is interesting because when we look at it, we keep on trying to put Holy Spirit in a box. Holy Spirit, you can only move this way. And the only way I've, been, the only way I've known Holy Spirit to move is this, and so if he tries to move another way, I stop him. And so we hinder the move of God and we hinder the move of the Holy Spirit because we want him to move the way we think, not the way he does. Because if Paul would have been like, you know what, you guys are going to have to go to an upper room somewhere. And you're going to have to get alone and you're going to have to pray until it comes. They would have been confused. 
because they wouldn't have known what to do. We're already disciples of Jesus. We already love Jesus. Like, what are you talking about? I have to go into a room now and I have to wait for something? I got bills to pay. I got to go to my house. I got things to do. What are you talking about? And Paul was like, no, nah, don't worry about that. I'm going to just lay hands on you. And as soon as he laid hands on them, they got filled. So people that say, well, I don't know how to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Let somebody that's filled with the Holy Ghost lay hands on you. And those people that received the Holy Spirit did not fight and keep their mouth closed. That's the problem. We end up trying to logically make Holy Spirit move in our life. Can I tell you something? Holy Spirit doesn't move logically. Because if he did, we'd be able to control him. Holy Spirit does not move logically because if we did, we would be able to control him. We can't control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not to be controlled. The Holy Spirit is to be welcomed and then work together with in partnership. But we like to control him. We want to logically make him move. And he doesn't move that way. And in the Bible, we see that things happen different ways. Okay, and so we see Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. We see it all the way going around that the Holy Spirit was just moving. If, if we could just let the Holy Spirit move and not control a service, not control the way things are supposed to go. Like some pastors would have never let a demonstration like that happen before they preached. But why? That's a great demonstration. And it's information that we need. Where is the blueprint on how we're supposed to do service? Show me, and then I'll follow it. But I follow the blueprint, and the Holy Spirit just moves. So you allow the Holy Spirit to move and do what he needs to do. Verse 8, then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next, what, three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, not about his own thing. If you're going to argue with somebody or if you're going to persuade somebody or if you're going to reason with someone, don't reason off of your own logic. Preach the gospel. Show them Jesus. And so he's doing this, and it says here in verse 9, you got to love it. Here we go. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message, and publicly speaking against the way. So it took three months for them to get enough energy to go, you know what, we're going to talk, about, we're going to talk against this now. It didn't happen immediately because Paul was in there for three months. That means for three months he had haters in there listening to him. For three months there was haters listening like, I can't wait for the time where we're ever going to strike. For three months they were listening and hearing what he was saying and thinking that he was, and then things were happening. At first they probably wanted to hear him be like, okay, that's good. I hear what he's saying. Then the next time he came, it was a little more rougher. Then the next time it was against their, against their law. And then the next thing it was against Moses. And the next thing, and before you know, he starts preaching Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then he got everybody riled up. And like, no, 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 that's enough. And they start preaching publicly against him. So guess what Paul did? Paul didn't argue. What did it say? The next verse. Say it out loud. He withdrew. He left. He's like, y'all don't want it? Oh, well, I'm out. Paul didn't argue with them. Paul was like, I'm done arguing with y'all. If y'all don't want this, I'm going out. And so he left. And when he left, it says here that he left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Those who were following Jesus. Then he held a daily discussion at the lecture hall of Ty, uh, Tyrannius. Now, some people believe that Tyrannius was somewhat of a Jewish rabbi that believed in Jesus and gave the school area uh, that he was running to Paul to be able to preach. So other scholars believe that he was a Greek that would go around and give, uh, it was very philosophical, and still he offered his platform to Paul to preach. Either way, the platform was offered for Paul to continue to do what he was doing by a prominent person in the area. There wasn't this thing where they were, um, where they were uh, trying to shut him down completely, right? And so it says, they went for two years. Two years. You know what that is? Three months in the synagogue, and then the, they get, the Lord gave him a platform for two years. Told him, hey, you want to kick him out of here, 
I'm going to give you two years in front of everybody. And then G the Greeks and the Jews, look at what it says here. It says, for two years, so the people through, throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. He was in an open forum. He was preaching the gospel. See, that's what the devil does. The devil tried to shut him up in the synagogue so then God put him in all display for everybody to see him. When you get shut up, just know there's a greater thing coming. When people try to stop it, when the enemy tries to stop it, when his thing is, I'm going to block you, I'm going to remove you, I'm going to talk about you, I'm going to do all these things, guess what God does? God goes, that's okay. When you remove yourself, you're going to have a greater platform. And so some people, their platform is waiting for them outside of the church, and they're scared. Paul's platform was outside of the church, outside of the synagogue. Many people don't want to take that risk. But Paul removed himself. Say, I remove myself from people who don't want to hear. That's not bad to do. That's biblical. He said, I'm out. And he removed himself, and God presented someone who would give him a platform for two years. He preached the gospel. Now watch this. This is where... I'm going to spend the rest of my, my time preaching this message. That was like the introduction. I had to go through there to get to here. Look at what it says here. It says, God gave Paul a power to what? To do unusual miracles. My Man, this is going to get so good. When handkerchiefs and aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Hold on. God, I, I began to ask God, I'm like, God, what's going on here? And then the Lord dropped it on me. And it was so powerful what the Lord said to me. And I wrote it in two different um, things. So I got to get to my phone as well because my phone has the other thing that I wrote. Okay, I want you to write down this word, access. Access, A-C-C-E-S-S. -S. And what I'm going to say is probably something that might seem a little bit, um, it's just going to be, it's going to sound like I'm saying God can't do something, but he can do anything. He chooses is what I'm saying here. Watch this. God chooses to only move through natural things. Supernatural is only super because natural gave it access. There is no supernatural without the natural. So God himself in heaven cannot move on the earth unless he has a natural thing to go through. He can't, right? So watch this. God uses elements, animals, humans, temples, whatever it is that has matter has access to heaven. I'm going to say that again. Whatever is matter has access to heaven. You know how I could prove it? I just told you it's handkerchief. I got a handkerchief at home. Who got handkerchiefs? Did George cast out a demon? You wear an apron, right? Some people wear apron for grilling, for painting, whatever. Has that ever healed a disease? But the Bible's telling us right here. God gave him unusual miracles that handkerchiefs and aprons that were merely touched his skin were placed on sick people and they were healed. And that they placed the handkerchiefs or those aprons on people who had evil spirits and they got deliverance. Now, when I started thinking about this, I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. Paul was so submitted that his temporal and materialistic possessions 
became access points for heaven. He was so submitted to God that everything that he had was an access point to God. That's how submitted he was. He was so submitted to the call, so submitted to Jesus, that even his handkerchiefs were able to carry deliverance. He didn't have to be there. All they had to do was take, and here's the thing, a handkerchief is something you blow your nose with. Or you wipe your sweat with. So imagine, they're like, yo, I just blew my nose, I don't care. And they run with something that got blown boogies in it or sweat. They lay it on a person and a demon goes. This is Paul we're talking about. And people didn't care. Why? Because there was something supernatural happening. Well, what happened was this. God was looking at Paul, and he was so submissive to his call that, watch this, ready? Even the enemy recognized his clothing. The enemy recognized his materials. Because I have a handkerchief. I have a handkerchief. I've seen an apron before. I've never gotten next to an apron and go, ooh, Ramataka. I never did that. But there was something about Paul that was so supernatural on him. There was such a heavenly atmosphere on him that even his materials, the devil submitted to. Are y'all hearing me? The devil submitted to materialistic things. The demons that were inside of people screened out of people and left people from material. That's how um, uh, uh, submitted he was, right? Now watch this. If that's the case, then what else does God use? What else can God use that's yours? See, we think he's only using us as human beings, but the natural part is everything. Because the Bible says that the fullness of the earth is the Lord's. So watch this. Guess what brought deliverance to the children of Israel? Water. Water split, correct? That's a natural element. That ain't supernatural. I can go to the beach today. I can touch the water that they walk through. Not the same one over where they're at, but it's still the same thing. It's water. God uses natural things. Ordinary things. Things that we take for granted. The stuff that we wash dishes with, the children of Israel walk through. And we don't think about it because we're looking at this so spiritual and so like, oh, it's, it's got to be the third heaven and open up in the realms and angels and all this other stuff. And God goes, I will use a rod. That came from a tree to bring my glory. Let me ask you a question. How many times did the army of Israel walk by that brook that David saw them stones in? The only reason why that stone became a powerhouse was because he was already submitted to God. So that children of, the children of Israel, the army of Israel, they probably lapped in there. They probably drank water out of that brook. But when David showed up to fight Goliath, that stone became a weapon because of his submission. Not because it was a stone there. Because if they would have known that stone could knock down Goliath, they would have all grabbed it. But the stone wasn't what knocked down Goliath. It was David's submission, and he said, not by power, not by might, but by the Lord, you're going to drop down today. And he goes, I'll just grab this stone to show how powerful my God is. I'll take this little rock, put it in a sling, and it'll become the power of God across your forehead. That's a natural thing. So when you submit yourself all of your possessions and all the things that you have become an access point to heaven. We think it's just us, but it's our clothes too. We think it's just us. It's our car too. 
Whatever we use. That's why a microphone, when somebody brings a word to you and it's delivered, what is these TVs doing? What are the cameras doing? They are connecting with the supernatural power of heaven, and the natural thing is now a conduit for God to move and heal somebody in their home that ain't even in this place. Because Paul never went to those locations where his apron and his handkerchief went. So we have to understand that things are very interesting when it comes to God. We got to stop saying that God can only move supernaturally when we see 35 angels. Or we see a pink one and a blue one like the Power Rangers. God moved through natural means. When Gideon, what did he say? He had a lamp. And he made noise. God used the crashed up lamp and noise to confuse the enemy to kill themselves. Gideon didn't even fight that fight. All he did was submit and say yes. Even scared, he still said yes. And when he said yes, guess what happened? God used a mere lamp that Gideon probably used every night to go hide because he was scared. And he was doing that at night, and he was threshing wheat inside the wine press. So that lamp, that same materialistic thing, became the weapon of heaven because of his submission. See, we, 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 we look at this, and we don't think about how powerful it is that a material became heaven. That material became the finger of God. Demons recognized Paul's clothing and realized that it was on somebody anointed. Oh, my gosh. This is amazing to me because now we look at how God used the donkey. Because why? Because the animal submitted. If the donkey can submit, we can submit. Isaiah was in a temple. It said that the, the robe of the Lord filled the temple. And then the angels came and they touched him with coals on his lips. This is all natural things. God loves to use the ordinary. I'm going to show you where he does it. Watch this. The spirits responded to the anointing on the material. Here's another one. Here's a shocker for you. They, the, the handkerchief and the apron can't say the name of Jesus, but demons got cast out. Jesus' name was not mentioned. But there was a level of anointing on Paul that was so strong that when the apron touched the person, it was as if Jesus was there. His clothing. Because why? Because Jesus makes everything supernatural. Peter's shadow was attached to him. And it said that they would lay people in the street for his shadow to pass by. That's a natural thing. Everybody has a shadow. So what made Peter's shadow better than ours? His submission. See, you don't even realize that if you submit to a certain level, you could be walking through shop, right? You could be walking through the mall. You could be walking through somewhere, and your shadow hits somebody, and they get healed because of the level of submission that you're carrying or the level of faith that you have. See, the reason why we don't see supernatural things happen, the reason why we don't see God invade the way we want him to invade is because we don't believe it can happen today. We don't believe that our shadow can heal somebody. Oh, that was for Peter because he was one of the 12 that walked with Jesus. No, Peter had the same Holy Spirit that I have inside of me. So if Peter's shadow heals somebody, then my submission, my shadow can heal somebody if I walk by. I don't even need to say anything. Remember, Peter wasn't going around. Bless you. God bless you. God bless. It said he just walked through the town and they laid where his shadow was. Just a shadow. Notice he didn't go, be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. It doesn't say it. 
So we think the only way supernaturally things are going to move is if we say Jesus' name. And yes, it does. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. But what I'm saying is these are instances right here in the book of Acts where Jesus' name was never mentioned, but the person that was used was so submitted unto Jesus that heaven used this shadow to heal. Paul's own handkerchiefs were used for healing. Paul was like, yeah, yeah, here, just take this. And I'm pretty sure they probably cut it up in pieces and gave it to everybody around that village because people were getting healed. They were like, you got healed by Paul's handkerchief. He didn't come around. No, I've never even met the man. They just told me to take his handkerchief, and I'm whole now. Look at me. I'm free. The demon came out of me last night when they laid his apron, a piece of his apron on my forehead or on my chest or whatever, and it just came out. And today, that generational curse is broken because there was a man who was so submitted that his clothing changed my life. His clothing. He never even showed up there. God gave him crazy miracles. You know that the only way heaven can come down is through us, right? I'm, I'm going to say this, and people need to realize, heaven does not intervene without us. So if God says, I'm willing to, if you say, God, even my hat can be part of, can be yours, God will use your hat. You could put it on somebody else's head and have a demon get cast out. Oh, well, that sounds crazy. No, that sounds Bible. That sounds like that's what Paul was doing when he was doing other things and they were taking pieces of his garment. But I remember a story about a woman who had 12 years of an issue going on. And I remember that the woman, everybody was touching Jesus up top, but she didn't even touch him. She touched the hem of his, his clothing. And all virtue came out of Jesus. And he said, who touched me? And Peter looks at him and goes, yo, everybody touching you. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. Somebody pulled from me. And they didn't grab the ankle. It would have been one thing if the Bible said that, he, that she grabbed his ankle. I get it. Or she would have grabbed onto, you know, somewhere in his knee or something like that. But it says the hem of his garment, which means she didn't even touch his skin. She touched his garment. That changes your whole closet now. It does. Because if something that I'm wearing, because of my submission, can hold the glory of God to the point that deliverance comes out of my garments. And we think that's why our, our dear brother, Prophet McGee, gives handkerchiefs. Why does he do that? Because Paul did it. And how many of us have handkerchiefs from, from McGee? And when you feel it some type of way, what do you do and go? Put it in your wallet, put it in your back pocket, put it around your arm, something. Why? Because there's an anointing on it, but McGee ain't next to you praying you through. We need to understand that God wants to move supernaturally through us, and I think it's time for us to realize that he can use anything. He can use anything that he wants to move supernaturally through us. He wants to take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. The handkerchief and the apron was not special. Because a handkerchief and an apron was worn by people and used by people for forever. But it was something special about the one that Paul had. It wasn't because he made it or that it was his. It was because of what was on him, the anointing on him, the submission on him, his reverence for the Lord, his reverence for Jesus, his willingness to suffer. We're not ready for that. You know what's the one thing? That God told me yesterday, and it kind of, it, it really messed me up. It really messed me up. You know that people were crucified before Jesus and after? Y'all didn't catch it. I said there were people crucified before Jesus, and there was people crucified after Jesus, but what they were crucified on wasn't that special. 
the tree that they were on, the saint, they crucified hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people. What was the difference? Submission. We think about Jesus as the only person that ever got crucified in the whole entire world. He had two thieves. In be- he was in between two thieves, which means that they crucified people on the regular. That was their, mo- that was their, their aim or their, 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 um, their way of dealing with criminals. We're going to crucify you. So before Barabbas was taken and exchanged for Jesus, I'm talking about when Jesus was a little kid, people were getting crucified. It was the Roman way of doing things. But there was something different about when Jesus got crucified. That tree no longer became the tree. It became the access point between life and death. That tree became the access point for my freedom and your freedom. Everybody else been crucified. Who knows how many people been crucified after? Paul, listen, Peter was crucified upside down. There were other people that were crucified. None of it mattered. It was one thing. It was the submission of the son that turned that crucifixion into something special into something that would give us deliverance, into something that would break us free from the bondage of sin. We keep on thinking that Jesus is the only person that ever got crucified. He was crucified for my sin. You know they crucify people still? They, people, they do people that, in, that, uh, that reenact that thing. Ain't nothing, that's demonic. Ain't nothing special about that. But the tree, the the, the cross, the the stake, whatever it was that Jesus was on, the reason why it became a beautiful thing and an amazing supernatural thing was because heaven accessed it. Can heaven access your materials? Because a tree belongs to God. That means your money belongs to God because a tree is money. Because paper is money. So then we go and say, well, then we ain't, we're not, we're not uh, tree huggers and we're not people who serve. You know, we don't worship trees, but you worship money, which is a tree, which makes you no different than those who worship trees because you're worshiping what comes out of that tree. And you give your allegiance and your submission to that. And so the only thing supernatural on you is the thing that the enemy uses against you which is the money. But if you just say, you know what, that belongs to God, and this belongs to God, and this belongs to God, and this belongs to God, then it becomes easier to release things, because why? Because it's not yours. It's an access point. If what I give to somebody else gives them a piece of heaven, and it gives them freedom, it gives them deliverance, it has some way or some, somehow healing comes through my giving of something, then you won't be stingy anymore. Paul, he just, it, it, was, it was naturally in him. But see, here's the thing. Some people try to do what Paul did without submission. Now, this is going to rock you, right? Let's, go, let's keep going. Verse 13. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Now, this is, he, this is funny, right? We know the story. The seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, they were doing this. Sceva was the father. The seven sons never mentioned. But one time they tried it, and the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus. I know his garments. Sickness had to leave this lady that was 12 years bleeding. I know, I know his cross. I know what he did. And then he goes, and I know Paul. I know Jesus, and I know Paul. I know Paul's garments. We submit to those things. Demons leave at his aprons. Sickness has to go when they lay his handkerchief on people, when they lay the handkerchief that belongs to him on people. But you guys, who are you? And when he says this, look at what happens. This is the part that gets me every time. It says here, the man with the evil spirit leaped on them. 
leaped on them. Number one, watch this, overpowered them and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house, what? They didn't even have respect for their clothes. Huh. But, but Paul's clothes. Woo! <laughs> Demons couldn't rip his clothes off. They couldn't touch his garments. But these guys right here going in a fake name. They were like, in the name of Jesus who Paul worships, in the one that Paul serves, they didn't have no relationship. So their garments were not ready. Their garments weren't ready. The demon said, I respect even the clothing of Paul. Who the heck are you? Your clothes don't even give me any type of, uh, of, of fear. You realize that when a handkerchief was coming to a sick person, demons were in fear. Paul didn't show up. His clothing did. These seven sons of Sceva show up and end up leaving naked. They said, we don't even respect your clothes. We don't even respect the, the natural on you. That's how much they beat them up. Now, when you look at this, look at the difference. Do you know Jesus or don't you know him? Are you submitted to him or are you submitted because your pastor tells you to submit? Are you submitted because you see apostle doing it? Are you submitted because you see prophet doing it? Are you submitted because your favorite televangelist and the person on the TV told you to do it, but you ain't got no relationship with Jesus? Show up and your clothes won't even be respected. His clothes were respected. It said, Paul, evil spirits came out. These men going around claiming to be deliverance ministers. Claiming to have a relationship with Jesus. And the devil called them out. I know you because I don't know who you are. Paul, I know. Man, you don't understand. I'm tired of his handkerchiefs going around the town. He's telling everybody, we're all leaving. We ain't got nowhere to go. Everything is being removed. We're in this place where all these, like, I set up shop. The enemy's like, I set up shop here with sickness and disease and evil spirits. And Paul shows up, and he don't even have to be at the house. All he has to do is send his clothes, and we got to go. We're evicted. But these skeevers dudes come up, and they're like, uh, you don't scare us. And the demons overpowered them. It was one man that overpowered seven. He was that. But here's the thing. When you truly have the anointing of God on your life, submission, suffering. What did Paul have to go through? Suffering. What did Peter have to go through? Suffering. But his shadow healed people. See, we want the spotlight. That's why we have no power. We want the spotlight, and we want to be seen, and we want to be heard, and we want the flyer, and we want to travel around the world, and we want to do all these things with no power. But those who are suffering, those who are going through it, those who are willing to go through the suffering that it costs for the anointing, even their clothes are going to be anointed. But you can't say, I want the spotlight. And expect to be powerful. Because now you're putting yourself in a place where God will put you if you just submit. See, what's interesting about this whole passage of scripture that I just read is that God wants to use natural things. There is a real natural thing that God wants to use. You know what it is? It's you. And he wants to use your clothes. He wants to use your car. He wants to use whatever, it, your, your, your home, whatever it is. He's going to use it if you submit it. Paul was so submitted, he said, God, I give you everything. Why? Because Paul's the one that wrote, I no longer live, but. So if Christ truly was living in Paul, that means that it wasn't his garments to begin with. So when it was asked of him, he just ripped it because it belonged to Jesus anyway. 
I'm sending Jesus your way. That's all we are. We're access points. Everything that we have, everything that we do, everything that we possess is an access point. And we just think it's one little thing. We think, look, isn't this a natural thing? But what happens when you read it in faith? It becomes what? It becomes an access point. Access points are only found where faith is. If you have doubt, you have no access point. Because God doesn't want to give something to somebody that doesn't please him. Now let's look at the, uh, 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 real quick, we don't have to go there, but listen. When they lowered the man that was a paralytic, his boys are lowering him down in front of Jesus. They knew they had to have an access point. So guess what God did? The healing was already there because they were in front of Jesus. But the hole in the wall, the hole in the ceiling became the access point for heaven. Because they wanted to see how bad. See, we want really God to move on, but we don't want to make a hole in the ceiling. We don't want to give an access point to heaven. God only moves on access points. That's it. If you read it from beginning to the end, Paul, I mean, excuse me, John is suffering in the island of Patmos. He had been dipped in oil disfigured. He didn't look good. He was messed up. But Jesus showed up because he was an access point. Can you allow yourself to be an access point? Now, here's the thing. Ready? Now I'm going to really get in your business. If you are artistic, that's an access point. If you write with a pen, the pen is an access point. If you draw, if you paint, if you poetry, what it's an access point. You know why I know? Because you can read something and receive healing from it. You can hear a song. Now, listen, I think about music. Music is an access point. The demonic already know how to use that. And so they put out all kinds of messages, all kinds of music out there, and what you receive is a portal from their dimension into your life. And here's the thing. We keep on being corny with what we do. Our music is always just one-sided. We give one note, Jesus died, Jesus died, Jesus died, Jesus died, he rose, he rose, I'm a filthy rag, I'm this, I'm that. We give one access point, we give one note, and God goes, I'm bigger than that. Talk about everything, because I'll use it as an access point. There's no, if God can use a donkey. He could use your song. Now, I'm going to get it even, even more deeper now. It ain't got to be Christian. Because I remember watching Forrest Gump. And I got, one time I got a crazy revelation from Lieutenant Dan. Y'all remember the part where he could not walk? And he had the storm come across the boat. And the storm was hitting, and Lieutenant Dan got all the way to the top. And he was like, just take me. I'm done. You don't love me anyway. I can't walk. I can't do this. I can't do that. And Forrest Gump was like, Lieutenant Dan, God's going to give you your legs. And he wanted to die. And when Forrest Gump's wedding came on, who showed up? Walking with the cane. And Forrest Gump looks at him and goes, Lieutenant Dan, you got your legs. He was like, me and God made peace that day. So you're telling me God can't use that because there's some other stuff in there that's inappropriate. We're, we are clearly boxing God in when God can use 
anything. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. There is nothing that God can't use if somebody gives it access. But what we love to do is give the devil access to everything. That's the devil, that's the devil, that's the devil, that's the devil, that's the demon, that's the demon. So God's like, dang, can I get in there somewhere? Does everything have to be the devil? Because you give him more access than me. Paul was giving access to God. Peter gave access to God. You look at the Bible, and they give it. David gave access to God. Listen, Samson messed up. David messed up. Paul, um, Peter messed up. You have um, uh, 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 Moses messed up. All, they all messed up. They were, they were individuals that were flawed, but they chose to do one thing in their flaws. They gave access. Can we just give access? Because God's going to use something. That's why God uses people that don't even serve him sometimes. They'll say something and be like, yo, I can't believe you just said that. What'd I say? I don't know. It just, why? Because at that moment, God goes, there's access there. There's access. We only want God to give us, we only give God access when it benefits us. I open up, God, because you're about to bless me. But when it ain't about you, can you still give access? When it's about the other person. When it's about something else other than yourself. When God's been telling you over and over again, write your daggone testimony, and you don't want to write it because you're afraid of what people are going to say. But he's like, I don't care what you think. This is access for me to reach into people's lives. Write your testimony. Bible don't say for no reason that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our. The world would know Jesus in a greater measure if we just told our testimony. But we want to hide behind a shando. Like we ain't been just straight up nasty before we came to the Lord. Like we didn't smoke and drink and party, sleep around. Lie, cheat, be deceptive, cunning, all that stuff. And we want to say, oh, well, you know, Jesus is in my life now. So, you know, I tell people all the time when I tell them my story and stuff, they be looking at me like, that's crazy. Like, you don't look that part. And it's because I'm far removed from that 20-something years. But if you would have known me in the 90s, which some of y'all were never even born, but in the 90s, I was wildin'. I was drinking, I was smoking, I was partying, I was doing all this stuff. That, that was what I did. So I can't forget about that because when I tap in, listen to me, when I tap into my testimony, I give access for God. I say, God, I'm not glorifying this testimony. I'm giving you access to it so that it can bring glory to you. And so a lot of times we're afraid to access the thing that God took us out of because we don't want people to know who we were. Come on now. Paul had to deal with that. He killed Christians. He locked them up. He incarcerated them. Now he's living for God. So there's a big uh, 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 thing that God wants to do in this hour with us, which is give him access so that all of us, everything that is of us, can be used for him. That's what it is. And so God only wants to use Natural things. Don't get so supernatural you forget you're natural. Don't get all high and mighty because you know how to pray in tongues, got a couple of revelations, and you've seen a vision. You're still natural. You're natural. When you wake up in the morning, nobody's praying in tongues waking up in the morning. They yawning. They want a cup of coffee or tea, or they want to just, they, 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 listen. We need to stop this cliche thing that when we wake up, we flying. Because we're lying. You're natural. Online, you're natural. You're natural. And then God goes, oh, Moses was natural. He was hanging behind in, in, in Midian. He was a murderer already. He was running from his past. He's like, hmm. I'm about to show up in a natural element, a burning bush. 
He showed up in a natural thing. I'm pretty sure Moses probably walked by those same type of bushes all the time with those dang on, with, with the sheep. It happened. It so happened that that day, God gave God got access to something that belonged to him to speak to Moses. Everything that you see belongs to God. So you can't say it belongs to me because it doesn't. It's borrowed. It's given. It's, 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 it's been gifted to you. That's why we can't be stingy with God. Because God wants to give us more, but we think that what he gave us is all that we're ever going to get. You have to release. Give access to God and release the thing that he wants you to give. We have to do that. Last thing. These sons of Sceva were, were uh, perpetrating something that they weren't. This is a warning. Don't fake. Don't fake. Too many of us are faking this walk while at home with somebody else. We're faking when we come to the gatherings. We're faking when we come to conferences. We're faking when we see each other in the street. But when you get in your car alone, when you're in your house by yourself and nobody's around you, don't perpetrate because there might be a moment where you get called out. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Mm. Who are you? You just, because you have not given access. The sons of Sceva were perpetrators. They are fake. And they were going around trying to cast devils out. They were going around trying to do something that only heaven has access we cannot act on, on heaven's behalf as perpetrators. We have to have a humble, submissive understanding that everything that I do, everything that I am, and everything that I am ever going to do forever belongs to God. And it's no longer me who lives, but Christ who lives in me and in my submission even my garments make the devil flee. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. I hope that blessed you today. Everything that you have, guys, everything that you have, you, you, you got to understand that. So let's just stand to our feet online. Thank you so much for being with us. We're going to pray, dismiss. I'm sure there's food back there in the mix. Make sure you get some food. God is so good. The microphone, your phone. Your phone could be an access point to God or an access point to the devil, depending on what you post, depending on what you watch, depending on what you, who, who's, who's in your contacts. Your TV. Your, 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 your streaming subscriptions. Just remember, God owns it all. There's nothing that God doesn't own. Every material is his. If he can make the water split, if he can make the rocks cry out, If he can cause the earth to open up and swallow a bunch of people and then close it back up. Everything that's on you is from the earth, including yourself. There's nothing that's not from here that's natural. But when we give access, my goodness, even your clothes become an access point for the kingdom of God. 
And so, Father, we thank you that today we are submitting everything to you, even our clothing. That, Lord God, we, that gives a new meaning to hand-me-downs or giving a gift to someone or releasing something that is ours into someone else's hands. It's an access point. And so, Father, I thank you because you give us great examples in your word. Paul, the apostle, his handkerchiefs, his aprons placed upon people, and demons fleed. Sickness left. May we understand always, Lord God, that you want to use us as an access point. That we are not, Lord God, just sitting around taking up space, but Lord God, you're trying to invade earth through us. May we be, Lord God, channels and conduits, Lord God, and, and, and access points for your kingdom to flow in this place. Lord, we learned about communication this week. May our communication be tapped into the realm of heaven. That what we speak be from the throne. That what we speak be from your mind. And that we understand that everything that we do becomes a channel for either darkness or light. Every song we listen to, everything that we create, Lord God. Lord, even the Bible itself. You wrote this, Lord God, through men. Through men that were flawed, through men that had back, that had backstories, through men that had uh, 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 situations in their lives, Lord God, but you use them nonetheless to create our instructions. Holy Spirit, help us to continue the legacy and being used of our gifts and our talents to bring glory to you, Father. Everyone who's creative, just raise your hand if you're creative. Whether you create f whatever, food, whatever it is, you're creative. I really feel this in my spirit. I just saw the Lord do doing something that's like a, a, like a recharge in your creativity. Some of you feel like you've been, even myself, I feel like I've been stuck in creativity. I've been trying to write. I can't. I've been trying to do different things. And the Lord says, because you haven't given access. If you give me access, I'll give you the blueprint. If you give me access, the Lord says, I will show you creative things you've never thought before. All you have to do is give me access. And so in here and online, just, just say, I, Lord, I give you access to my creativity. Use me to bring heaven into earth through my art through my food, through anything that I do, Lord God, that is in a creative way. I want to see healing, deliverance, and freedom be brought through my creations. Because you're the creator, and I submit my creativity to you. Use me now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Guys, have a great weekend. We'll see you guys on Wednesday. We start the armor of God with the breastplate of righteousness.